Um, good morning. Thank you so much. I'm Susie Silver, she, her pronouns. I want to first thank Creative Mornings and all the sponsors for this invitation. I am honored. I have been watching Creative Mornings for a long time and actually my past educator life was very hard to attend because I was always in class. And to think about the scope of who has shared this stage, and now I'm part of that, I cannot thank you enough for this honor. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for spending your Friday morning with me. And there are so many familiar faces and voices here and so many of you that are new. Welcome. I am going to walk you through an interesting journey today about Ripple, a personal journey, both artistically and personally, professionally. And, you know, before I start talking about me, I want to also welcome you into this space with me. It's a safe place. I'm going to share some really raw and vulnerable things. And I just want you to know that you're safe to share. You're safe to ask questions. I love questions. So I'll talk as fast as I can. So then I can come off of the screen and just see all of you and talk. Uh, but it is a safe place. And the community here over this story I'm, I'm going to share with you has made me feel safe to, to be me. And that's part of the effects of this theme for me. So we're going to walk right in. So when we think about Ripple, Okay, so I looked up, okay, well, what's the definition of ripple? I know how I interpret it, and it's exactly what the introduction said, the ripple effects, what happens with impact, with something in life, and what comes from that? Well, I also have it in the artistic sense, and, and you're going to see a lot of my artwork throughout the session today, the talk today. If you don't feel like looking at me, that's totally fine with me. Just look at the artwork <laughs> um, and immerse yourself in it. So when I looked up definitions of ripple, some words kept coming, wave, ruffle, wrinkle, rise and fall, and that flow and movement, all of which I actually feel like you can see in this piece of artwork. This, this is a piece from a few years ago. And it reminds me always, all these words, and then each piece that I create about this continual journey that I'm on, we're all on. And I just hope that what I have to share with you today from my life um, will resonate at what I want you to think about as I'm talking. And as you're looking at the artwork, think about this list here. So not just in the artistic sense, but where have the waves been for you? What's ruffled? Where was the wrinkle or wrinkles? How do we all rise and fall? And then what happens when we move? and flow. And so a continual two themes, and if you've heard me speak before, or you've just had coffee with me, or we're just chatting on the porch, quite often, there are two things that come up for me and how I am, where I am today. And those are themes of resolution and authenticity, both as an artist and as a person. And what I'm about to do is take you on an artistic journey, and I'm probably gonna leave you hanging a little bit. And then I'm gonna give you a personal journey and they're gonna come together. And when they come together in a little bit, that is the absolute impact. I, I thought of almost the trite image when I was thinking about what I was gonna say today of when I bring these stories together, almost the trite image of the, the impact of a rock or like a water drop and the literal ripple effects. And I also have to say, so many of you in this space with me today have been part of these two things. And so I'll, I'll talk about me, but I will also get back to community. So I'm just gonna put a lovely piece of artwork <laughs> up for you to look at uh, while I'm telling this artistic journey. And so just be comfortable. I'm gonna start as the artist. So welcome to my artistic world. Here's some of my work and I'm gonna show you more in a little bit. This is the first um, big story. Well, you know, I get asked all the time, when did you start being artistic? When did you love art? I'm not gonna take you through my whole life, but like a lot of it. Um, and the joke in my family, I'm 40 years old, it's still the same thing. If you gave Susie French fries and crayons, she'd be happy. Let me just tell you, if you bring me French fries and crayons, I'm so happy, you know? So it's still the same thing. So how long have I loved art, been artistic, 
my entire life. I was the kid that looked at the pictures and didn't want to read the words in the book. I am the talker. I'm an extrovert. It has been through and through for my life. Of course, let's skip a whole bunch. I went to college for art. I have a BFA in studio art with concentrations. Actually, a lot of people don't know in glass art, so glass blowing and ceramics. And here I am a painter um, right now. And of course, I always was drawing and painting and doing other um, media, but that's my background. And then I have minors in art history and art education. And it's important to know that because those things will come back in the story. Graduated, I went to school in Western New York, Alfred University. If anybody knows that, you can put it in the chat. Tiny little town, one traffic light. Um, but I had a fantastic experience up there. I worked a lot at Corning, especially with glass stuff. Uh, loved my time and work up there. And I'm from Pennsylvania after college, typical like 21 year old. <laughs> I moved home to Pittsburgh. I was waiting tables. I knew a friend down here, one friend. And she said, Susie, I, I think you're kind of looking more to start teaching. <laughs> you can laugh. It's, it's a thing we all know in 2003 and it's getting better. But she's like, look, teachers don't make a lot in North Carolina, but it's a really cool area. You should come and see what happens. So honestly, there's a story to that. But I packed what fit in my car and I, I met one person in Pittsburgh that I said, hey, do you want to do this thing? You want to move hundreds of miles away? And she said, sure. She's actually still here and still an educator. We're still friends. Um, and we drove down here. And I never looked back. And now I'll talk a little bit more about that in my personal journey. Why is that important artistically? Well, I started teaching. I had the best teaching job you could ever have, which is, I think, sometimes hard for a public educator to say. I just ended literally in February my career as an educator at Cary High School. If anybody knows Cary High School, um, you'll see a picture of some of my colleagues later and some, some things I'll share. I always said, if I'm teaching, art in public education, I will be at Cary High School. I love the students. I love the people. I love the area. And that was true. And I held true. It's a very rare, I'm a rare statistic as an educator to be at the same school for almost 18 years. And um, so what happened to me? And this is to no fault of anybody at the school, the school district, my students, because I know some of them may be here or watch this or see this. I completely lost myself. So here's this lost and found, this, this wrinkle, this, you know, going back to those words. Every single creative thought, idea, energy point I put into my students. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. I just, oh, that's a cool new material. I got to make a project for the students or, oh, let me, I feel like drawing. Well, let me do an example. So they can have exactly what I know the expectations are, you know, and this is year after year after year. And what happened to that person who held the studio degree, who was really trained to be the artist, you know, I just lost myself as the creative person. And I'll tell you that really was hard for me. And I didn't realize it till many years later. And throughout the years, I did some I made some jewelry, shout out to Ornamentia way back when, my Raleigh people, I spent a lot of time there, um, and Cynthia and I are now um, friends, but I spent a lot of time there, I made some jewelry, I actually did some glass jewelry, I bought a kiln, put it in my kitchen in my townhouse, I didn't have a table, but I had a kiln in my kitchen, <laughs> true artist there, um, and I did some things here and there, but I just, nothing stuck, I should have a show called It's Not Finished, uh, because I have a lot of actually hyper-realistic work that's not finished. Later, as I in my teaching career, uh, I would just do things that I thought people wanted to see. Here's this authenticity piece. I started creating that hyper-realistic work because in some senses in the art world, it's got to be real to be good. It's got to be realistic. Well, we, I think most of us here know that that is not true. I had dug myself in such a hole of what everybody else was thinking, what everybody else thought, what I thought everybody else wanted from my students to the school, to the community that might come to a show that I may have one day, I just disappeared and it stuck. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, so fast forwarding, so I can get to some other exciting parts here. I share that because I think whether you're an artist, entrepreneur, you're in corporate, you're a parent, 
you're with a partner, like we've all had those moments where we know we've disappeared. And it's how do we actually find ourselves again, which honestly, that's the hardest part. <laughs> and how do we arrive? So we'll fast forward because I'm going to get into my personal story and how I met my now wife and that story, which is very important. But I will say about five and a half years ago, I'm fast forwarding through a lot of things and just trial and error and not really loving what I was creating, not doing much, not starting businesses to sell, none of that stuff. We had our first child in 2014. And um, within the, the next year, my wife said, hey, I, I think I want to start a business. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? And I know I'm talking about art and then I'm jumping here. I'll get back to it in a second. I said, what are you talking about? Okay. I mean, what do you want to do? And I really need to give the credit to her. She said, I really want us to start an infant and toddler clothing line that's gender neutral. Now things have progressed slightly, but the family being who we are, the kids that we were trying to raise um, and to break down gender stereotypes and all these different things we're very, very passionate about. She said, I want to start this business. And long story short, we, we started Redbird Goods. You'll see our logo later. It was our first business and we were screen printing right here, which is the dining room, was a screen printing office, was this art studio and now an office. We were screen printing in this dining room and curing the shirts in our oven and we hit the market scene. And this is extremely important in the artistic story because I hit the market scene and a lot of you are here as Redbird Goods and we started conversations. We sold some shirts. We definitely lost a bunch of money, <laughs> but that's okay as entrepreneurs. I mean, it was fine, but we were talking to people. We were meeting people and what happened? I saw some need in my area for a market, locally made market. I know some of you have participated and have been to it. Started locally made market a year and a half later. Now a huge market. We're on hiatus because of COVID, but hope to be back. And I skipped through a lot of that. The creative community embraced us unconditionally for who we are and what we were saying. And what inherently then happened is this fire came and I started painting. I started playing and something when I'm teaching I, and something, please write this down. When did a lot of us stop practicing and playing? I love a hashtag, use the hashtag practice without penalty. And so I started resolving, here comes back to a lot. I started resolving all of the things I thought everybody else wanted. I had this art pedigree, those of us in the fine art world understand what a burden that can be um, and to carry. I released that. I resolved it. I started playing. I wasn't making art to sell. I wasn't making art for anybody to see. I was making art for me. And what came out was this abstract expressionism, non-objective work, a lot of process-oriented things. And I went back to what were inherently my inspiration points, nature, time away. I needed time away from the noise. If you read my artist statement, that's part of the reason it's non-objective. There are no images. What you all see in any piece is for you. And I want it to make you forget about the 17 emails you have, the crying child, the you got to cook dinner, we're in a pandemic. Like that is my hope. And so I was doing that for me. And here's the thing. It started taking off. Somebody my mother-in-law's neighbor came over and was like, oh, I like that. Can you do a couple pieces for my dining room? Okay. How much is it? I don't know. You know, I wasn't even thinking about that. And I'm very lucky in my story of, it was a lot of hard work, but my business as Susie Silver Art, I say, was very fluid. I started showing some things here, some things there. Somebody from the market scene was doing something at a local spa and said they need an artist. I have 20 some pieces in there. I started having a show there. I'm like, yes, I should start an Instagram. Maybe I should do a DBA under our LLC. I mean, it just was starting to happen, but I had to stop and be responsible because it was becoming this entity of a business when it was for me. Was I going to lose myself again? Was I going to start making work for everybody else again? And so um, I just kind of learned how to balance that. The ripple there is that I just started making. I resolved. I was authentic. I was making stuff that I wanted to make. And I was welcoming feedback. I was welcoming engagement. But I was resolved in the notion that may not happen. And I actually think because I was so resolved and because I just 
I care about people and how they react to the work, but I know inherently it's for me. That's why it's successful <laughs> because I can talk about it. There's a story behind it. You know, uh, for my inspirations, it's water and land and rock formations and aerial views of maps. I love concentric rings. So thinking about ripple, then the visual of a ripple, the concentric rings, you'll see that in work coming. Um, and that's kind of the first, it just started happening. I just started working. And let me tell you, I was in here at all hours. We had a small child. We now have a second child. I mean, it was just a mess. Thank my wife, because we have no door on this room and anybody who has a studio knows it's just craziness all the time. And then here I'm running a market as well. We had closed down Redbird Goods. And again, with the support of my spouse saying, your art is what you need to be doing. The business wasn't making money anyway. You know, I mean, and we did it. We started the conversations. We met people. We had impact on our community through locally made market. And here it was my time to be the artist. And so again, that was like 2015, 16, 16, 17, with was a lot of inertia, a lot of movement, a lot of flow. And it sounds easy. Nothing is linear. Nothing is really easy when you're building yourself as an artist and when you're also responsible for business at the same time. Uh, but I've been very, very supported by many of you here. So thank you. And I'm going to show you some work now. And that's where I'm going to kind of leave you hanging. And, and mind you, I gave you years, 2015, 16, 17. So I'm going to come back to that in my personal story. But I wanted to show you some work. These are two of the first pieces that I actually put out in public. Um, these are with alcohol ink. I'm not going to talk a lot about work. I just want to breeze through these. And here's the thing also about authenticity. I use mediums, materials like alcohol ink, um, acrylic ink, acrylic paint, fluid acrylics, uh, resin. I use, I love, I'm like a chemist. <laughs> I want to break everything down and figure out what the components of every single material I'm using. And I put them together in a new way. Part of the authenticity is some of these mediums are common. A lot of them are. If you go on Instagram, maybe you see 700. Oh, you can tell exactly what that is. I challenged myself and I do to this day as I evolve as an artist, what do I do that's different and authentically mine? What's my artistic voice? And so I'm constantly pushing. You'll see the evolution through different stylistic things. I also will say I'm now at Art Space in Raleigh. I moved in like October, November. I'm so happy to be there. This is another series. Think about Ripple on these. As soon as we talk, as soon as it said, Susie, we want to talk to you about Ripple, I thought about, these are called my dissected pieces. There's a lot of process to those. Feel free to ask about it later. Again, similar to what you were seeing earlier. And these, these are from a series called Move. And the reason I kind of end, these get a little bit more aggressive as they're very simple, but they have a lot of energy to them in a different way. And it was kind of like this series, I do a couple per year and that's it. Um, I haven't done one for almost two years, year and a half now. Um, it is literally about me moving or move out of my way, or I'm going to continue. So that flow that, you know, and getting through. So th there's some uh, more, I don't like to say aggressive, but there's more intensity to some of these pieces here. And these are huge. I mean, they're like 40 by 30. They're, they're many feet by many feet. So some of these are very small and some of them are very large. Here's another piece of artwork. <laughs> this is from a current series I haven't released yet. Um, so let me talk a little bit about my personal journey and then I definitely wanna um, get to the place where we can chat. So I took you through some, some which is personal, of course, but I wanna talk about resolution and authenticity of who I am. I am married to a woman. It was a package I didn't expect. I went through a lot and we went through a lot. And it's not just about Anne is her name, um, my wife and I, it's before that. So as a public educator, you know, I needed a few jobs all the time. Plus I enjoy working. If any, any of you that know me very personally know that I enjoy working because I enjoy people and the process of creating and being together. Well, I also love the restaurant industry and the service industry. So I know that's really important to our city. It's a staple of who we are. And I was immersed in um, fine dining, bars, restaurants. I, since I was 17 years old in Pittsburgh, in the back of the house, doing everything in the back of the house, everything in the front of the house. So if you're in the service industry, I highly respect you. I've literally done every single job there is to do in a restaurant. Um, you know, uh, and so 
that's what I did on the side because it was great money. It was a wonderful pace for an extrovert and I got to know people. And that provided a lot. I could buy a house. I was very financially independent. Um, you know, just had a great life from that. What can come from that is a fast paced life. And I have to admit, and I'm very open that I feel like I just caught, got way too caught up in the after part of things. Um, and when I was about 27, uh, 27, 28, uh, I had already met my wife. We had been doing some stuff at school together. We were becoming friends. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting person. But, you know, we're just going to see how things go. Um, was very caught off guard by that. But at that same time, there like a summer hit. We had been working closely on this project for school. I, and then I went on a trip. And this trip is important. I went to Ireland. When I travel, I resolve. I take a lot of intense time to write, to think, to be alone and to be silent. And I was very caught up in this. I was at working at a bar at the time, bar life, nightlife. I had met this person who was actually helping me. She didn't even know it, question things internally. And I went on this trip and I thought, I looked myself in the mirror and I know that sounds so cliche, but I looked myself in the mirror and thought, who is in here is not what is outside. It's not how I'm acting. It's not necessarily who I'm hanging out with. It's not how I'm spending my money. It's not how I'm spending my time. I am meant to be more productive in some way. And I meant to be more productive, one, to myself and two, to my community. I came back from that trip. One month later, we were together. We've been together since almost 13 years. And so part of that resolution was opening my heart, right, to something unexpected and different. What occurred in the next year after that is that some of my close people in my life were not okay with who I was. I was outed, um, which in case you don't know that term means I, my, my sexual orientation was disclosed to people very close to me without my consent. It was extremely traumatic. Um, there was some disownment of, of a kind. We're in a much better place many years later. So I really want to make sure that's noted because there's been a lot of work done, which has been very beautiful and very hard. Um, but I was diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety, depression. And this, again, this was 2007, 2008, 2009. 2009 was not the best of years. Um, and my friends and some of my family rallied around. And I'll hold that there. And if you have been through that personally, or you know somebody who's been through that personally, there's not enough time today or not enough words to describe that experience. So getting back to some of the resolution and being authentic, you can only imagine that I thought something was wrong with me. I didn't know, again, who I was. This is still in the time period I wasn't creating. So I'm not being creative, which is part of who I am. My entire identity is being questioned. My, my purpose and who I am, I'm a good person. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I'm a public servant as an educator. I work multiple jobs. Like I've never been in trouble with the law. Like I just don't, I couldn't understand that it changed everything for some people. And that took a long time for me to kind of work through. And I sought mental health um, support. I think it's very important that we talk about those things. And um, let's get to this awesome part of what happened. About five years ago, so all the time, the market and the business and me painting starting happened again, all this energy. Well, I finally got some more healing. We had been married. I I, we already had our first child. And of course, it's a lifelong process to heal and resolve. I was sit sitting in a faculty meeting one day. Uh, we do every year in public education, lots of trainings. Some are kind of silly, even though they shouldn't be. But something serious is a suicide awareness training. Um, and again, about five years ago, and we had our suicide awareness training and a slide came up about some risk factors, subgroups of students that are at risk. And then there was a, a different slide for the first time in many years. Mind you, I've been teaching a long time by this point. And it was a slide for LGBTQ youth. It said LGBTQ youth are 200 to 300% more likely for suicide and self-harm. And I had another one like in Ireland when I looked at myself and I knew like something in my body happened. I had that moment where in my entire body was electric. 
because then we went to the next slide and I thought, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why are we looking at this slide? And by, by the way, the LGBTQ youth subgroup was the most at-risk subgroup of students combined with all the other ones. I mean, it was just, okay, well, then why did we just see this and we're not talking about it? Why is there not a training? Why is there not an educational service to help teachers and staff understand LGBTQ youth, how to support in the classroom and also colleagues? Because I had been going through all of this stuff while I was still teaching. And um, I also realized something else. I had to start telling that story I just told you because it can help. And that was hard. And every time I tell it, it's, it heals even more. So thank you for providing that space for me today. Um, and so what did I do? I do what Susie does. If I have an idea, I just go with it. So I will seek out something to exhaustion. And I went to my principal who, mind you, in public education in North Carolina, five years ago, even to today, he said, what do you wanna do? You have my support. You will never get knocked down by anybody you speak up and you speak out. And I, along with one other teacher, I don't know if she's here, um, but she said yes to this idea. And together we created a training for teachers. We housed it at the school for a couple of years. We went to the county in the past few years. At the same time, my corporate buddies were like, hey, Susie, can you come tell your story? We have inclusive policy, but we don't even know what the acronym means. We don't know what coming out means. We don't know how to have inclusive language at the workplace, what can I do to support all these different things? That's when my other company with Pre Consulting started. So I had retired Redbird Goods, locally made market is, was still running, Susie Silver Art still running, and then I started with Pre Consulting. I am teaching, I'm a wife, and I'm a mother. It's a lot, you know. And mind you, kind of, I don't actually speak about it a lot, but I'm starting to speak about it more. I had two miscarriages in that in a lot of that time frame, showing up to work, showing up for myself, wasn't creating at the time. So all of these things here, we're going to come together. All of the things were happening at the same time. The artistic side of me was being resolved. I was becoming an authentic, creative voice. I was creating community, what I thought was impactful community. I hope it has been for many people. And my wife and I never let go of each other. And I resolved and I recognized I had to tell this story. And here we go to the ripple. Think about that impact, the impact of the story, the impact of what maybe I could say to help. But for my life, it hit and it hasn't stopped for five plus years. And I'm riding the ride. And I'll tell you professionally, um, some of you know, some of you are here. I just recently stepped away from my teaching career and also really with Pride Consulting, which is totally fine because I'm now part of an amazing group called the Diversity Movement in Raleigh. If you don't know about us, you need to. Um, where I'm with this super talented team doing impact work every day. And so the things, the ripple, the people I've met, I mean, the, the art shows or the sales, like somebody buys something that's 20 bucks to you know 2000. It, I am blown away and I'm honored. And again, I bring it back to, yes, this has all been a ripple effect of these moments in life. And sometimes the hardest ones are the most impactful ones. We just have to get to a place, share your story, please. I was so afraid. I was so afraid. Imposter syndrome is real, right? <laughs> why, why would anybody want to listen? I even had that moment. I called a friend. I was like, are they sure? Yes, Susie. What's wrong? I was like, oh yeah, okay, I'm good. I want to tell this story, right? Like I want to tell this story. I'm confident in that. I have my feet on the ground. I'm authentic. I will never again apologize for who I am, what I create, what I do in this world, unless I do something wrong and I need to say I'm sorry for. And um, that's kind of where things kind of come back together. And I'm going to just take you through a bunch of pictures. Let me tell you, going through not just the past five years, but the past, since I went to Ireland, you know, till now, 
how could I show that to you? Nobody wants to see that many pictures. I'm going to click through. This is me and my wife. I'll tell you the day we got married, Boston, Massachusetts. If anybody's from Boston, we're on the harbor on a boat. It's awesome. Um, I got to start with her and I'm going to end with her. And while, and you know, we talked and she goes, Susie, your story isn't just about me and us. And she's right. It started with a lot of my resolution. And she said, you've got to say that. So I'm glad she reminded me of that. Redbird Goods logo. I don't have all the logos. There are shirts. Oh, the spa. My goodness, this first safe that we called it safe zone and like the binders in my thing. I got some awesome leadership awards. Penland School of Crafts. I did a residency. I like, I couldn't believe it. I almost fell over. That's my co-art teacher. Well, that are listed. Who, my goodness. I mean, it's crazy. Art space. I had a show in art space. I never thought I'd have a space there. You know, my goodness, this is one summer of stuff a couple years ago. An award starting to speak on the stage people empowering my voice. This actually was with Pry Consulting was named after this event. This is at Flourish Market and Gray's here. Um, there's a bunch of people from Raleigh here. I said, I want to do this event. I want, you know, queer female business owners to talk. And M as an ally said, what do you want to do, Susie? And now the company was named after that event. Actually, I went to Nashville two years ago. That was extremely important two years ago because in two years, Everything I had done in a vision session, I accomplished. And again, it's not easy, but it happened. Just friends all over pizza, full side, all over the place. Thank you. Thank you. That's my wife. Went to the Biltmore. I'd never been there. <laughs> um, and so until kind of recently, but um, COVID style outside. So I'm going to open it up soon. It's a lot of life to take you through. It's a lot of art to take you through. Let's embrace the ripples because I think so much it, it, right? The ripples create the waves and the waves are unsteady. They can even make us sick, you know? And it's, it's what we do when that starts calming down and we start flowing again. Where can we pinpoint those things that are impactful that can change? And I do hope that some of you have resonated with something in this story today. that moment that you chose to move to North Carolina and take a job here. And I was really curious how you found the courage to move to a place where you knew so few people because you you clearly are an extrovert and community <laughs> so much to you. And so I'm really curious how, like what motivated you and drew you yeah. to this area? Yeah, the, uh, thank you for that question. Um, there are a couple things there. So one, I was, I was a young graduate, I was 21. So I graduated high school when I was 17, not because just because of when I went to school. Um, and, you know, so I was a college graduate, which I was really young. I was working in restaurants. I thought I'd get a teaching job. And this one friend, like I said, just had moved down here from New York and said, look, it's a cool area. I know you kind of don't know what you're doing, where you're going, like right now. Why don't you come down for a little while? It was really kind of a temporary thing. But then I started thinking about the area, researching it, recognized I wanted to be here, sought out some interviews and got the job. So I interviewed, Wake County used to have this huge teacher fair. And I'm certified K-12 and I actually, I flew down here. This is in May at like May before the school year I started. And you had to like run and sign up for interview slots. So I took my shoes off and ran. I started with high school, got a couple interviews, like, like signed the sheet, ran to middle school. And I was like, okay, okay, elementary school. Like I love kids, but I really wanted to teach high school. And my goodness, Carrie High was the first interview of the high school. They called me back and they said, are you still in town? I took a, I took a taxi <laughs> before Uber and Lyft. I had no car while I was here, didn't rent a car. Took a taxi to my second interview. And they called me three days later when I was back in Pennsylvania. They said, you want to come? I said, sure. And oh, I shocked my family. They had, they knew I went down there to interview, but they didn't think I was serious. And then looking back in reflection, because I've done, like I said, a lot of therapy, a lot of reflection, obviously through the story. I always knew I wasn't going to be in Pittsburgh. I didn't know why. And here's the thing. I now know that I came down here to create my own life. So my life was decided for me if I would have stayed. Not a bad life, great life. The life I kind of have right now, but it was built for me. It was decided for me. So I inherently know now it was my escape. And I actually had thought, I, I almost left teaching multiple times. 
random fact about me. I almost went to culinary school. I was into pastry, like way back before, like a lot was happening. So I was actually recruited by like Johnson and Wales and like schools up in New York because I had a sculpture and glass background. So I actually was going to go into chocolate, <laughs> chocolate work and, and sugar work and pastry work. And that was a real thing about two, three years into my teaching career, almost left. Um, but just, I kept getting drawn to this area. So kind of a long answer, but there's multiple little like things, energy points going off with that. Um, what are ways you found your footing and created momentum when you're coming out of a dark period? That's great. Hi, Em. <laughs> I didn't find my footing all the time. Others help, helped me find it. I mean, in the time that um, I had the very traumatic situation, it was like a three day, I was in Pennsylvania. It was like a three day, extremely terrible time. Uh, and in that, for example, um, I slept I slept on friends' couches, on their floors. I didn't eat. You know, I didn't get out of bed if I could sleep. Um, it was hard. It was, thank goodness it was summer because I wasn't working. Um, so how did I find my footing? By the people around me. And here's the thing. If I was a teenager, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this. This is very important in the work that I do. If I was a teenager that had experienced this, I would have been the 200 to 300%, right? I don't think I would have been here. So I survived, right? And because of how did I find that footing in that particular time? And my very good close friends. And that's, you know, when we all go through stuff, I'm sure we've all been there. Like, the, you know, who's going to show up like, and the, they'll show you. And I had to extract some people and that was really hard, but I had to do that. So, and then in tough, dark times, I mean, I was diagnosed with autoimmune disease in the last couple of years. That was really difficult on the couch, not knowing what was happening in my body. And I would just reach out to people. And um, lean on community. I know I keep saying that it's hard. What I hope for people is so maybe you don't know anybody down here, but maybe somebody was here today, reach out to me, you know, or I will help you get somewhere because I think if it's not family, if it's not friend, and I also sought out mental health support. I'm privileged enough to, I had insurance, I could afford that. Um, there are so many great places that can support, but that was huge in different parts of my life that I needed support with. So great question. Hello. Hi. Is my hi. audio okay? I did test it before. Yes. Yes. Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you so much for your time. That was amazing. My girlfriend, Katie, invited me to this. I have it. This is my first creative mornings. Oh, and okay. I can already tell like, this is going to be like a regular part of my like life now, because this was so amazing for me from the I just moved to North Raleigh from Iowa about a year and a half ago. So I related to a lot of things you said when you were talking about your life was decided for you, right? Mm -hmm. I come from an athletic background. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be a tough guy. I, I played college football and I was going down that route and I just, I was miserable. Like I was mm -hmm. so, but it's because that had been decided for me when I moved down here and I'm starting to actually find like find out who I like decide who I am not letting other people decide that I I I've realized I've wanted to be this like artist type entertainer type person my entire life the problem with that now is this imposter syndrome is kicking in because right. all these people <laughs> who are in my life have this certain ideal of who I'm supposed to be because that's who I've been projecting because that's how I get the validation of being the athlete and people liking me and all this other stuff that goes on mm -hmm. what if, if that is something you struggled with how, how'd you get past that? Like it, that initial thing moving down here, everyone's like coming against you. Oh, she's, ugh, what is she doing down there? What, she has no idea what's going on. How, what helped motivate you through that? Great question and welcome to the area. Now you have all this, this community here. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, oh yeah, it was a real hard day. I, you know, as much as I've been through with my family, you know, my, my dad and I, my parents are um, very lucky. They're still married. They're together. My, I'm, I am very close to my dad and driving out of the driveway. I, it's like the movie, like the cheesy movie. My father was like hysterically crying when I, <laughs> and I could barely see out because I packed whatever fit in the car. And, you know, to, to the questioning that came a lot of the times, I just said, I just, I knew I had to be here. So just feel grounded in yourself. And I've talked about noise a little bit, especially in relationship to my work, but in general, try to find systems and practices that help you drown out that noise. So it could be walking or meditating, working out, doing your artistic craft, um, going for a walk with somebody, whatever it may be. And you will know, you will know, you know, you told us, you know, you know, right. And so Basically, I kept having to say, trust me, 
I'll figure it out. And if I mess up, I mess up. And I've messed up. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? But you got to trust me. Please let me, give me the space and time to figure this out. For those of us who would not claim to be artistic, what are ways we can tap into creativity as a tool for healing and growth without being intimidated by not feeling good at art? I love this. I do teach adult workshops. They're coming back soon. Um, I love teaching. I love educating. So I, I have a workshop a little bit on this, but just pick up if it's a paintbrush or a pencil or a pen. There's a lot in just like, there's a lot that's therapeutic in just, um, like pressing down on a piece of paper really hard with a pen or pencil and then just trying to lift it up and like twist it. And just again, kind of lost in the doodle aspect, like do repetitive patterns. If you want to press hard, if you're getting things out, if you want to be flowy, get things out. And it's not to make a piece of art. Sometimes art comes out of that, but it's this creative brain space that you go into when you're again, silencing out that noise. Joel would be a great person to hang out with, <laughs> urban sketching and all of that, and, and many, many um, other artists on this call. Um, but those are just some ways, and take a class, like especially locally, I'm not even saying me, there's so many workshops and things you can do to just pick up and they're like quick, and you can have an experience with no pressure, which is how I design my workshops. But there are so many where you can just pick something up and then do something for a couple hours and let it go. And my hope is that then people will take something and just play. So again, um, was that notion of practicing without penalty, especially with artists, like I can't draw, I can't paint, it's not gonna look good. I don't know how to make it look like this. We have to start forgetting about that stuff, which is really hard and just try something. So yeah. Hello everyone. So Susie, love all the messages about being in acceptance and all these things. Uh, been following and I saw you shifted into diversity. I guess the question would be is, is right now, what's, what's needed most? Like, what are you seeing that people like us can work on in oh. this? Cause it's, it's like the most important, in my opinion, one of the most important things is that acceptance of that interconnection that, that we yeah. all have. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to answer this as quick as I could because sometimes Let's grab a coffee. <laughs> yeah, sometime too. So I absolutely agree with you. Thank you for bringing it up. So with that said, and I can't believe I ever got to say this. Thank you for letting me into it. My story, these stories have completely redefined my purpose. Completely. I would have never thought that this is what I'm doing. Like you said, you've moved into it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe it. Um, what can we do? Well, in the artistic sense, we have got to really face that it has not been a very inclusive place, especially in the world of fine art. And I think there's momentum going in that, but who are we amplifying? Who are we not amplifying and recognizing that? Um, how to support courageous and uncomfortable conversations, not only in the art world, but outside of the art world. But I think even events, like what if we had a beautiful show that highlights so many diverse components of our community. And then with that show, that's a great, that's a show. Let everybody tell their story. Let's bring everybody in. Well, I mean, virtually or in person someday for an event to talk about, let's bring it up. Who have we seen in museums? Like who do, who can we, you know, to the galleries, to the markets, to the shows, in the stores? Like we, we have got to face that. And I think it's really happening. I don't know um, if, if any of you agree, it's starting to happen, but this journey is for the rest of our lives. So going into broad diversity, quite often, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? Susie, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't wanna mess up. It's already bad enough. Well, here's my advice. Start somewhere. Small things will add up to make big things. We are gonna mess up. Let's try to work through our confidence issues, our fear issues, and think about ways we can be allies that we are empowered with. So one thing, just correcting somebody's language, saying, hey, you know, I heard that and I'm on this allyship journey. This is something really uncomfortable to me. I'd love to talk about it, but I will be pointing that out. You know, the, how you also bring people, some people will say, call people out. Um, I say, call them in or call them forward, right? That's not from me. That's not my own words, right? Um, and it's the approach. And there's so much um, in the chat. I'm like, I'm, I want to go back and, and read. So, um, 
and we ha we have to recognize our privileges, right? That's some a lot of work I'm doing is that privilege is not a dirty word, and we need to recognize what our privileges are and what our challenges have been. And when we recognize those things, we embrace them, and that gives us power to lead, and to talk, and to change. And um, I think. We need to start somewhere and we need to also, I said it before, acknowledge when we're wrong. I am sorry for moving forward. I will Amber Cabral, if anybody follows her um, and go from there. And, you know, something personally, you know, I'm a queer Jewish woman. <laughs> so I recognize underrepresentation. I also recognize I am cisgender femme white lady. So if I have the opportunity to step aside, pass the mic, have a tough conversation, I do it. And I recognize that sometimes people may listen to my voice. I don't agree with it at first sometimes. So I'll bring people in and I'll say, okay, great. Well, you need to really be listening to them or something. It doesn't mean I'm doing anything better than anybody else. My goodness. It's just a little allyship mark. Um, but there's just a lot the, the sense of, and to kind of end the question, Cornelius, the I'm finding more of, I want to do something. I want to say something. I want to start somewhere and I don't know how. So when you don't know how, reach out to somebody and say, hey, where are you at on your journey? What could I do with you? Reach out to somebody you see in the community and find a way to get involved. There's a lot of us to help support, right? And um, Cornelius, I saw you put something in the chat. I don't want to miss it. Um, yes. So we hold, right? We also can get diversity fatigue. We are part of underrepresented groups. It's, it's, I have made it my, my mission and my job to do this work. And I'm not putting that on anybody on this call, but sometimes we also can get that fatigue. So the more allies we can empower and have out there, the more that energy is also shared. And so all that's gonna go on. So also remember we're in like a marathon till, till we are no longer here. The sprints happen, but the sprints tire us out and then we stop. That's what we've seen in the past. So we're on this marathon. I could talk all day on this. <laughs> I hope that helps kind of answer some of your questions.